Okay, you guys, welcome. Uh, this is the eighth uh, live painting situation we're doing in kind of this uh, social distance learning. And I'm going to try and do this uh, painting. Each week I'm trying to do something a little bit different rather than be too repetitious. Uh, this week I'm doing kind of a little, oh, I, I, little kind of waterfall stream, kind of waterfall up in uh, the Lake Tahoe region near Squaw Valley. Up Shirley, uh, Shirley's Lakes Trail hiked up there. I've done a couple of paintings of that area. And so I thought I'd do it because I haven't done anything quite like this yet. Um, what I'm going to try and do is within the reference, which is right here, you can kind of see what I've got. What we're going to do is I'm going to try and uh, diminish the darks here. So they're still dark, but they're not going to be as black. Strengthen them here, bring some warms up. Uh, I'm looking for the movement of water. And the movement of water kind of comes from here, goes behind this rock, comes down, splashes down in here, begins to come this way, sneaks out between a few rocks, comes down, it joins into a big splash here, get a little bit of reflection, a few rocks underneath, and then it kind of, there's kind of a rock underneath rock wall that the water spills down and splashes. We have a nice foreground element. I diminish some of this foreground stuff. I'm not going to put this in. Uh, it's too difficult even in looking at it to understand it. there are rocks that kind of sliding down. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. Going to stay with kind of the similar palette that I've worked with week after week. Uh, white. I threw some yellow in because I wasn't really sure what I was going to do until about 10 minutes ago. Um, got some nice Naples yellow light. My tubes came in. I asked for, I got about two tubes of that. Some yellow ochre, a little cad red light, even though I don't probably need it. Lizard and crimson to help with the warms. Uh, I th always lately I've been throwing some dark sign purple. I'm not sure. I use it more in the darks. A big clump of ultramarine blue. I have I added these two blues. I added the radiant turquoise earlier. I really don't think I'm going to need it. I know I'm going to need the uh, radiant blue, which is kind of adds some kind of coolness. Sap green. Uh, a little bit of combination. What I did is I took burn umber and asphaltum and mixed them together. Uh, with some medium and then I finally got some halfway decent raw sienna that came in. So that's pretty much the palette. I also have the solvent free gel and I as you can see if I can even make heads or tails out of I did the sketch really in about 10 minutes just to get an idea of placement of rocks. There's so much going on here I needed a little bit of information so with this pen I kind of did this kind of stuff sketch. That's a shadow I could, I could sketch in the shadows if I want to, but I'm not going to take the time. Uh, these paintings that I do during these sessions are really quick. Uh, you guys may or may not think that, but they're really quick. I don't generally paint that fast. I paint this fast specifically for demonstration purposes. Uh, and it, it tends to be a little looser and a little bit more impressionistic. Uh, that I might otherwise do. Now there are people that prefer that, that like that. I tend to like to tighten up a little bit more than I do in these, but uh, there's something about the spontaneity that's kind of fun and challenging. So with that, let's start from the back and move forward. Hang on. Technical, difficulties Technical difficulties. Hopefully the sound is <laughs> hopefully the sound is okay for all you guys. Uh, I think we began to solve that a little bit last week. So a little ultramarine white and and the uh, brown, and I got a dark here, but it's not real dark. Hopefully it's gonna be about the right darkness. It's gonna sit back in here. Nope, want a little bit more warmth to it, so a little bit more umber. Um, these are judgment calls, truthfully. You might paint this a little darker, and that's not necessarily wrong. Um, I just wanna try and keep this a little bit more distant. So. We're kind of laying all these darks in with as big a brush as I can. I'm doing that. I'd probably do that if I were doing a longer painting too. Uh, I'm doing it a lot because I'm doing a shorter painting, <laughs> meaning time-wise. So we're going to kind of get some of those darks back in there the way we see them. Some of the dark shadows, this dark mass as it moves over. And we're going to simplify some of the line work that I did, which is really uh, indicative very very indicative put a little some of these darks up in here so I have them kind of as placeholders so I kind of have this area approximately laid in the way that I see it 
I'd rather paint a little too much and have to paint over it than I would paint a little too, too less. There's a lot of little rocks back in here. I'm probably going to not be able to individualize those as much as I want. We'll move on to the shadow. The shadows are important in this case, everybody. Uh, mainly because they're going to give me the overall placement of elements. So the first shadow I'm going to start with is the shadow on this rock. And I've got to move quickly or I'm never going to get this done. So we're going to move up on this rock down here. There's a rock behind it. I mean, a rock below it, which is this. It looks like the shadow that I've indicated with my line. And my line drawing may be off, by the way. I did it so quickly. I may have left things out. I don't know. And if I leave things out, that's the way it goes. It just means that rock wasn't there. So you can see, and I can move with a little bit of medium. And in this case, it's Terp or Gamsol. Uh, I can move the paint around pretty readily, and I want to keep it thin at this particular time, uh, mainly because I can move it faster. It might be fun to paint a little thicker as I move along. Um, hopefully I'll be able to. I'm going to add a little bit of warmth to that color, maybe with some ochre, a little bit of a red. Not much, just a little, just a tweak. I, I can actually see it as warmer too, so maybe a little bit more brown down here. And I'd rather, like I said, let's get a lot of that rock in there. There's a little division here. Um, I'm looking at this area. So I'm trying to kind of, the busier that your subject is, the easier it is, and probably a lot of you already know this, the easier it is to lose place, lose your place. Where the heck am I in this painting? And we, I don't want lines around everything, and that's why I'm not, I, I'm, eliminating my indication that I did in here. We got some darks back in the trees. Let's kind of smack them in a little bit. I call it trees. It's more foliage, some growth. So we want to kind of get, so I don't have to work too many of those darks in later. Let's get them in now. It also helps the design uh, that I'm looking at the composition. So let's keep going a little darker. It just means I'm adding a little blue and a little brown as we come forward. And that all, I do, all that does, truthfully, is eliminate the white. It just, I shouldn't say eliminate, it diminishes the white. A little shadow on that rock. Say that again, what diminishes the white? By adding more brown and more blue. What that does, because I'm not adding white, I'm adding just the brown and the blue. So that's darkening it. And it means the amount of white that I have in compared to those is less. So here's some cast shadows, dappled light on this rock. I want to get it in a little too too much. I'm probably going to darken that it looks like. Right now I just want to get as much of the information down as I possibly can so that I have something to build back on. Appreciating Chuck Pyle's uh, commentary off to a rocky start. Uh, thank you, Chuck. I was hoping you'd be. I need a few of those. Just keep them coming. Keep them coming. The inimi inimitable great artist and illustrator, Chuck Pyle, ladies and gentlemen. And must I say, also, very good friend. Thanks for hanging out with us today, everyone. Boy, is that a mess. If you just saw that tuned in right now, you'd go, why in the hell am I even looking at this guy's work? We're going to make, hopefully, sense out of chaos. Okay. Okay. We've got, starting to get a lot of this beginning to make a little bit of sense here. Oh, there's a nice, juicy, dark, kind of warm rock right in the middle of the painting. Comes down. This rock comes down, there's a shadow below it, and there's a rock here. Some of these are, I, I call a lot of this stuff as I do it placeholders. It means it, it's giving me information as to where things sit, but I may change it. And that goes back to the line I've used weekly, and I'll, I'll use it again. Paint like you know what you're doing and assume you're wrong. Because if you do that, you're not tied to 
all these wonderful mistakes that you might be making in the beginning. So we're going to get kind of it. Now we're going to get this big old mass of dark in here. And for that, I'm going to use a lot more of the umber and maybe a little bit of the raw sienna to warm it up. And we're just going to kind of smack. Oh, is that loose? That's real runny. Very, very transparent. A little bit of blue in it to darken it up. And up here, because that's all reflective light. That might be actually work really cool. And then again, it may look like hell. I'm hoping it works. I'm hoping I don't have to cover too much later. The more I have to go back on, <laughs> truthfully, the more I have to go back on, two things happen. Number one, it can begin to look overworked. And number two, time. It just takes us more time. So we want to get this shadow, which is kind of dark and cool, and I'm just scrubbing it in. I'm working on a piece of uh, toned masonite, just so you guys know, or hardboard, really, if you will. Um, 18 by 24. It's big, so I can really move paint around rapidly. I like working large. Um, I do smaller ones on location very often like 1216 a lot of people tell me that's big I don't think 1216 is large um, because I use almost the same size brushes and if I need to tighten up I tighten up that's one of the cool things you guys about having this wonderful illustration background uh, is because as an illustrator sometimes I work really tight and it was I didn't mind it it was a great little learning I always looked at everything as kind of a I'm learning stuff and if you can keep that in mind as you're painting uh, you're going to go a long way because that's what you're doing you're constantly learning you're, le you're learning as much when you do things wrong as when you do things correctly can we quote you on that yep you can quote me please do so I think Brendan uh son was referring to your comment about why the heck am I watching this <laughs> and said exactly what I was thinking <laughs> that means you, that, <laughs> either you that means either you don't have a lot going on in your life <laughs> and you're bored with what you're doing or uh, you actually think there's some value in this it's one or the other it <laughs> could be a little bit of both truthfully always fun watching mm -hmm. always uh, John wants to know if you're Brennan keeps Connor. watching me to to see if I screw up is what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Or just to heckle you from yeah. a distance. Um, John Conrad wants to know, are you going for value and pattern to keep it simple first? Y you bet. Value, pattern, thinking of color, um, but at the same time, not necessarily, um, you know, hammering down the exact color. I want I want to go as close as I can, but I'm also aware that, as I said, I'm, I may be wrong. So you're guesstimating. I'm guesstimating. That's absolutely what I'm doing. Now we're going to start at the top, work our way down one more time, make another pass. Let's start with the greens back there. So that I'm going to throw the sap grain in, a little bit of maybe the raw sienna to tone it down just a little bit, some white to mellow it, and it went too light on me. So I'll throw more green. I, I actually, what, what happened? I got too much white in it is what happened. So this feels right. It's too dark. I, I knew it as soon as I put my brush up there. Okay. This is kind of some of the foliage that I begin to see up in that region. There, back behind this tree. What did you use for that to mix? A little sap green, a little raw sienna, or yellow ochre and white. Okay, but not too much white. Uh, yeah, initially when I put it in, I put too much white in. I still want the trees to be darker, so that's fine. I can darken them later on if I need to. That's, that's an easy fix. A little bit of foliage that kind of pulls down in here. Great thing about this brush is you can kind of just lay it down sometimes and get the mark you want. Rather than sit there and try and paint each little leaf individually, which you might do towards the end. You might want to come in and individualize some of those. But at this point, for the sake of a nice impressionistic feel, we're just going to kind of put a feel of these leaves in there. And um, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to. Michael Godfrey wants to know what medium did you use as an illustrator? Mostly acrylic, right? Yeah, well, when I started, thanks, Michael. When I started, it was primarily acrylic. Um, and 
later on as more clients became accepting I moved into oil occasionally I would throw some gouache in there occasionally I would but the my medium of choice for and I'll, let me explain why because a lot of people have asked one of the wonderful things about acrylic it is the one medium you can change rapidly let me all right by that I mean if I'm using gouache which I, I think is great acrylics is in fact a lot of people have accused me of my acrylics looking like gouache uh, the great thing about acrylics is you can change it rapidly now why would I want that well anybody that's been an illustrator knows clients clients change their mind so you might get a painting done or near done and they see it and they might say you know we don't want that in there or instead of that could you add this so if I'm painting in oils uh, the problem that occurs is that I am having to wait for that to dry in other words for me to sometimes do some of the stuff that these guys want I could scrape it but I'm still fighting a lot of wet paint so with acrylics it's dry within 15 to 30 minutes and I can go I can wipe out an area I can go right back with my gesso wipe it out go right back to gesso and continue with acrylics so that was the that was a huge advantage particularly when working for something like the film industry um, which was notorious for changes so hopefully that answers that question because that's that's literally why you would use something like um, acrylics I became quite fond of them I, I and I still am I still do uh, where I teach at the Academy of Art I still do demonstrations quite often in acrylics and occasionally in gouache because some students that's what they want to work in so the, the, the medium I'm most comfortable with is probably acrylics secondly oil third would be um, gouache I guess or watercolor they kind of run hand in hand um, as far as I'm concerned gouache is more forgiving than watercolor meaning that it's opaque so I can change things a little easier in gouache than I can in watercolor uh, they all have great properties they're all fun and I switch off a lot I'm a I'm a big proponent of not being handcuffed to any one medium um, I'm not sure why I'm a proponent of that but I am can you speak about the values changing while drying in acrylic lights versus dark <laughs> yeah uh, you have to get used to it that's probably the thing I have to say most about it acrylics uh, in acrylics the colors change probably more as they dry than any other medium uh, if you paint with them enough you get very used and very comfortable to that change the the great thing about them more so than any other medium even oil is if as you're painting you begin to realize that I'm gonna try and start on some of these blue grays right now but if as you're as you're working you realize that the colors are dying I've heard this from other illustrators and I've heard this from uh, X illustrators well I can't get good color in acrylic I don't agree with that at all let me explain why if I get a dull color in oil I have two options think about it I have the option of going back and repainting the area or I have the option of letting that area dry and glazing it okay that second choice I'm, I'm working on the kind of blue grays in that rock and I see warms thrown in so every now and then I'm mixing a little raw sienna into it anyway let me go back to what I was saying uh, as I so <laughs> rudely interrupted myself um, the uh, fact that acrylic dries quickly and you can't disturb it once it's dry it's dry you can spill coffee you can sneeze on it you can do almost anything to it and it stays all right unlike gouache gouache is a very sensitive medium it's a wonderful medium but it's very very sensitive and in that regard you can paint over it you can't glaze it so with acrylics I can come back over something and really enhance a color if I want to strengthen a color I could glaze it immediately within 20 30 minutes that's the only medium you can do that with the only medium 
that you can glaze. The other thing is acrylics is inherently a transparent medium. It's not outrageously opaque like gouache might be. Uh, so I, if, you, if you play with it enough, you learn to use the transparency. And to get opaque takes a few layers. You can build those layers really nicely. You can use the, the semi-transparent quality of acrylics. I'm, by the way, you guys, just so I'm intermixing a little brown in with this kind of blue color, just so I'm solidifying some of the rocks. Uh, we got some interesting shadow forms coming up in here. I know I keep going off topic, so I apologize for that, but I'm trying to kind of do things. I'm trying to answer qu your questions and at the same time comment on some of the decisions I'm making. So, uh, so I'm not trying to sell anybody on any medium. They all are wonderful. I like them all. I enjoy them all for different reasons. Uh, now, the other thing we should at least bring up that I have is pastel, which is fun. I use it. I'm not a finished pastel artist like the great artist Albert Handel or my, my good friend Bill Mon. These guys are exceptional pastel artists. Uh, for me, pastel is a sketch tool. I, I like to sketch with it. Uh, when I was in high school, I did pastel portraits um, and made an okay living doing it truthfully for a for a teenager because um, I love doing portraits. It was my first interest in uh, in art. Uh, second interest, first interest is cartooning, a la Mort Drucker, Jack Davis, all these great heroes of mine. Um, and as I got into high school, I got a little bit more into doing what some people might refer to as serious art. Not that the other wasn't serious, because I think it was. Charles Bragg, another great name from the past that some, some of you out there may know or may not know. Just neat stuff. Just really nice, fun, fun, wicked sense of humor. It's interesting how how such a variety of artists can influence somebody uh, along during their path of um, becoming who the hell they are. Uh, Melissa wanted to know about what you did in the film industry. <clears throat> oh, uh, I worked in the film industry primarily in what I guess, for lack of a better word, you might call the advertising area, which has to do with film posters and any promotional brochures that were done for films. Um, and I worked in, in kind of a variety of areas. I did everything from concept sketches for ads to um, full color comps, which basically at some point became almost like smaller finishes because they wanted them that refined. Um, and then finally film posters, the actual poster that they used. So that was it. Everyone thought it was glamorous. I mean, I had students that thought, oh, cool film. It's a pain, everybody. It was, it's hard, hard work. And anybody out there that has done it knows exactly what I mean. It's just, you get a project on Friday afternoon, you meet with your client and they say, okay, I need something on my desk Monday morning. Uh, we want it 30 by 40 and, uh, Here's reference we can give you. Any additional reference you're going to have to find on your own. So you had to be very good at inventing things, creating uh, things, crossing your fingers, and using all, every ability that you've got and every, no, every piece of knowledge of mediums that you've got to kind of pull it off. So I ended up doing a lot of mixed medium stuff where I would uh, work primarily with acrylics sometimes use a little uh, pencil underneath that I might come through or charcoal underneath that might come through. Uh, occasionally, I played with some pastel on top, but not too often. Primarily, it was acrylic. That was it. Little airbrush. Airbrush became quite the big thing. I was never, there are so many good airbrush artists out there. To this day, I was never one of them. I, I learned how to use it and in, combination with my 
technical approach, which is more painting. Okay, can you see I'm trying to get these rocks to overlap now. I don't want it to, I'm trying to get it down without spending outrageous amounts of time in areas. So if I see a color change, I'm trying to get that in there. I'm trying to get that, whoops, I went way too light there because uh, the water is going to splash over there. And this, as the water splashes over this rock, it's a little warmer than that. So let's put, put some raw sienna back into that color, bring it down, let the brush do the work. By that, by that, I mean, don't over uh, labor anything. If you can, if the brush will do the work for you, let it. Do not try and sit there and be uh, Mr. or Mrs. Perfect. So Boots wants to know um, if you can talk about why when you paint uh, plein air, or at least when I painted with you, you always paint in oils. Why do you not paint acrylics then? Because oh, really easy. I'm trying, I'm still trying to learn all the technical ins and outs of oils. Um, that's why I, not that I know everything about acrylics, but I worked with acrylics so much in the commercial realm um, that as I moved into fine art, uh, the most of the art that has intrigued me over the years has been done in oil. And so always wanting to be as good as all my heroes. Uh, I work with oils and oils has more interesting versatility with the wet into wet. And I probably could get it with acrylics. I know some acrylic artists, uh, Gil Dillinger, John Poon, uh, Gil Dill. These guys are superb with acrylics. And I've, I started my career as a fine artist in oil. So I just want to get better at it, truthfully. And that's, when I do these things with for you guys here, I'm challenging myself. So I'm still, it's a form of me trying to get better. That's all it is. It's, it's, I mean, I love, believe me, you guys, I love tight, refined work and I love loose work. And so I myself personally get caught somewhere in between those two. And from time to time, I'll go very, very loose and unrefined and just with more expression in my brushwork. And then at other times, I either I've done too much of it and I want to go the other way and I'll turn around and go try and go more refined, but but make it look effortless. And I guess if I were just to describe my personal direction, it would be the latter. It would be trying to make it look effortless, but realistic. So um, Anne appreciates that you've been working with one brush, and John, <laughs> John wants to know if you could speak uh, to how you're drawing with the brush as much as painting. Uh, painting is drawing. Okay, let's start with that. Painting is drawing. It's not drawing with line. It's drawing with mass. Okay, so you're correcting. Um, as I, you know, I, I said a little bit ago, paint like you know what you're doing and assume you're wrong. The assuming you're wrong means you, you know you can go back and correct that. Uh, you know that if you gave yourself the opportunity and the time, you can go back and correct that. Now, let me relate that because this relates beautifully to the discussion about illustration. You don't have that time. Illustration, you make a mistake and there goes some of your time because Time is of the essence. Very seldom do you get an illustration project, and I think two or three of those guys out there can go along with me on this. Very seldom do you have time to go back and uh, a, a very good friend of mine, who's a phenomenal painter in his own right, Dan McCaw, uh, and I'd love to be able to imitate Dan. I don't do it that well, but uh, Dan's got a wonderful line, and that is that Every artist needs time to romance a painting. <laughs> well, pretty good. Okay? That's something I never was able to do as an illustrator. I was never had that luxury of time to be able to go back and say, I don't like that, I'm going to fix that. Um, you know, when time was up and the job was due, you turned it in. 
And if the client looked at it and went, yuck, then you got to figure out what you can do to, to fix it as quickly as possible. Um, you know, it's like, so you have to, you almost have to be more under control. And I think as a painter, what I enjoy is I have the opportunity to kind of, <laughs> just realize what I'm going to say. I have the opportunity to be a little out of control. Um, no. Yeah. And, but what I found over the years is a lot of the art that I appreciate has that element where it's, it does look like, it's like the guy put this abstract mark down in the right spot with the right character and it works. And it's like, to me, that's magic. If you can do that, that's magic. And so I like to push myself that direction. And that goes back to one of the things that I talk to students about quite often. And the word is intent. Know what you're attempting to do. Don't just start making marks and hope to God it works. Because I guarantee you it won't. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. You have to have a clear-cut vision of what you are trying to accomplish, whether it's very beautifully refined work. And I saw Michael Godfrey out there. Michael is just, a, just besides just having good taste, he's just an exquisite technician. I mean, I've seen him do little four-by-sixes that to me look like it should be a, 2436 because it's that refined so you know there are artists that do that and you know that's their intent I and mean, their intent is so clear-cut and obvious it's it's impressive and then you have like I mentioned Nikolai Fetch and you there's a Canadian artist up in Canada obviously um, and I just discovered his work recently a guy named David Sharp who paints in a very expressionistic landscape fashion and it's fabulous work it's exciting it's it's got it's got a lot of that out of control characteristic but he knows his intent as you look at his work you know exactly what this uh, guy was was trying to do and that he had superb control of it so you know you discover people another another artist that just totally blows me away is uh, the Australia I like to turn you guys on to artists that excite me. Uh, Ken Knight in Australia does these massive plein air paintings. Always on, it looks to me, always on some sort of hardboard or masonite, which is kind of what I'm using here. And he takes brushes and he uses almost spatulas, things of that nature. And he makes it just spectacular. And it's like I, I mentioned, it looked like these marks just fell off his brush, but they work. And there is, he has such lack of fear. And everything I've read about him, he was a sign painter. Maybe that contributed to it. But in any event, see, I'm doing paint into paint there. So I'm trying to get, if I begin to see a color variation in a rock, I'll try for it. Um, the more time I put in, the more of that color variation I can get into. The less time I put in, obviously, you have to live with what you have time to put in. So, coming forward, I want to keep my eye on the time. Okay, just about 30 minutes into it, I feel pretty good. Still with the same brush. Huh? Still with... <laughs> no, that's my question. <laughs> Still with the same brush. Okay. Um, I'm painting big big stuff. Why, why switch down to a small brush when you're painting big stuff? Um, Michael Godfrey has another great question. Um, when you were an illustrator, you dealt with art directors. <laughs> How do you direct yourself? Oh, good one, Michael. <laughs> Thank you for being here today because you're, know, you're great. throwing great questions. Um, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to come up with an answer that... A good friend of mine, and one of, to me, the best colorists alive today, a fellow named Anna knows him quite as well as I do, named John Asaro. Uh, John made a comment to me, because John, he didn't last as long in illustration. He, basically, as a, he just didn't have the stomach for it. Um, I was able to deal with it. 
John made a comment to me one time, which I think is just super appropriate. He says, well, you know, we were talking about what to paint. And he said, um, as an illustrator, you have to paint everything. You, you, you don't, you're not just a one trick pony, pretty much. I guess there are guys that are specialists. I wasn't one of those guys. I did a little bit primarily figurative, but I did a little bit of everything. So as an illustrator, we're being told what, what we have to get done for a client for whatever the hell their reason is. And they, you know, they're paying the bills. They have legitimate reasons that they want it done. So when you start painting for yourself, you have to decide, number one, I knew how I wanted to paint. Let's start with that. I knew I, cause I, the artists that I admired in museums were all, for lack of a better word, impressionists. Okay. In other words, their work, their work looked tight and refined, but it wasn't, it had beautiful mark making and wonderful color and great mood. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to see number one, if I could do it, and number two, paint the way, this was the big thing. And this is what I told John. I said, I just want to paint the way I want to paint. Right now, I don't even know what I want to paint, which is true, which to, to a degree is still kind of true. I mean, I'm, that's why you see me doing all kinds of different things in these things is because I kind of like it all. Um, in any event, I found that for me, it was, I wanted to be able to move paint and control paint the way I wanted it to. And in the end, have a result where I've mentioned this several times. I've used this kind of analogy where it looks like the paint almost fell off your brush at the same time. There was a beautiful amount of control, uh, you know, and all the artists that I admire and emulate, generally have that characteristic. Another phenomenal, and Michael knows who this guy is. Uh, another Michael, by the way, <laughs> Michael Workman has a lot of that characteristic in his work. Just good design, wonderful color control, edge control. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of good, good and great artists out there. And I mean that, I mean good and great. Um, so, for me to find who I was, um, let me think about that because I think I'm still struggling with that. Um, I One of the things that I did find that I enjoyed was kind of beginning to choose my own subject matter. And as I got more and more into it, I got more and more into painting landscape. So I like, I'm still a figurative buff, um, but boy, landscape is, it's not only fun, it's exciting to look at. So I don't know if that answers that question about how do you direct yourself? How do you direct yourself? I direct myself really by a little bit by subject. If I, if I do too much of one thing, uh, one thing's one thing I found, if I do too much of one thing, I want to switch off and do something else. The other thing that occurs is um, I'll see four or five pieces of art that are exquisite and I'll go, boy, that, makes me want to do something along that line. Uh, that's not necessarily a good thing, by the way. I don't want to be too influenced by others. And uh, when I started doing uh, my vineyard series, one of the reasons that I picked that is I saw no one else doing it. No one else doing it. And since we live up in the wine country, I thought I want to use what's around me and begin to you can call it pay homage to whatever, but begin to kind of work and use that because there, there's just an incredible amount of beauty there. A lot of people don't realize that, but um, to watch it, to watch it happen and see the light at that time in the morning. It's another thing that, uh, another, let me bring up, but just maybe your thoughts are happening as I'm, uh, yes, I actually think while I paint sometimes. Uh, I went to a I went to a show at UCLA, Anna's alma mater, 
Uh, I went to a show there uh, probably in 19, in the mid 80s, early 80s. And it was an American Impressionist show. And John was teaching, Asaro was teaching at Art Center with me. We were both teaching. And he said, I'm going to go to the, uh, he lived in San Diego at the time. He said, I'm going to come up and go to the uh, Impressionist show at UCLA. You want to go? And I said, hell yeah, I do want to go. American Impressionist, which I didn't know much about. Um, this was, may have been in the 70s for all I know. It was a long time ago. So we went and saw the show. And we went over and had a pizza at Numero Uno. And John said to me, beaches and kids on the beach. And I said, how do you mean that? And he said, that's what, that's what I got out of this. I really want to start pursuing it, which he did and became quite successful at it. What ticked me off is I had a film poster on my uh, board at home and I had to go home and work on that after I had just seen this incredibly inspirational show. And, um, you know, there wasn't much I could do. I literally had to go kind of put my illustrator cap back on and get back into it. That was one of the most influential shows that I had ever seen. It was spectacular. There were artists I had never heard of. Um, Tarbell, William Paxton. Um, I had heard of John, John Henry Twatchman, but a lot of these guys that I had never heard of just were just incredible and, and were inspiring. And so I started looking for their work in books, on, online. Well, sorry about online. There was no online then. Um, anywhere I could find it, I was looking for, to see what these guys did. The other thing that I noticed is that there was something that a lot of people know of called the Golden Age of Illustration. And that's Dean Cornwell, all these guys that were these exceptional painters, just exceptional. Pruitt Carter, Dean Cornwell, Mead Schaefer, um, you know, God, I, the, Haddon Sunbloom, uh, all these guys. And that stuff, I looked at that and I went, God, I wish I had illustrated then. Uh, not that we didn't have great illustrators when I was working too. We had Bernie Fuchs, we had Mark English, we had a lot of Bob Peake, all these guys, a lot of great, wonderful names. But it, they were, they had more, um, it was more contemporary technique stuff. And where the old guys, for lack of a better word, I am an old guy now, but the old guys, uh, their work just, just sung. I don't know. I don't know any other way of stating it. And you know, I just wished I had been because those guys were the painters. And it was during that era. I've read a lot of articles on this. During that particular era, a, a realistic painting was kind of not in vogue. It was very the avant-garde, the uh, you know late forties, fifties. And so a lot of these guys that were at N.C. Wyeth, Andrew Wyeth's dad, uh, a lot of these guys gravitated to illustration because it was a way they could make a living. You know, I mean, great, some of our great contemporary portrait painters, uh, you know, you, you take people like uh, Raymond Kinsler, um, you take Bert Silverman, who's Bert's still out, out there cranking beautiful paintings out. Um, and I told him once, I had him come speak at the academy, I told Bert there was a painting, and I described it. I said, it was a painting. I remember getting my American artist during my second year at Art Center. And I was... Magazine. Yeah, American Artist Magazine. And um, it was a rainy day. That's how, that's how clear I told him this story. In fact, when I had to introduce him one time, I, I started with this story. And... Uh, I said, so I turned to this page and there was this incredible painting of a girl with a cup of coffee just sitting there staring back at us. I said, at that point, I knew I wanted to paint and not just illustrate. And that was, that was while I was still in school. Um, so art influences you as an artist. I'm sure it, it does with everybody out there. There's, you look at art and you go, wow, 
that's I want to do that and then you try and figure it out you think about it and then all of a sudden you discover another artist and you say boy that's great I want to do that and I believe it all culminates and comes out you in the end um, so enough philosophizing Ray was saying that he remembers um, when you guys were talking about intent and you were showing him the work of Pruitt Carter and told him to go back and study Joaquin Zuroya yep yeah, and Ray's doing some of the really some of the most interesting color right now. So it whatever you did worked. Okay, I don't want to fuss on that rock anymore. Look, I'm a contemporary artist, <laughs> um, because that's kind of an in vogue thing now is to do drips. Another great man. We had some incredible painting teachers when I was at Art Center. I think we do at the Academy right now too, but when I was at Art Center, there's a guy named Jack Lenwood. And yeah, everybody loves Jack. Yeah, I, someone just wrote me recently about Jack. Um, Jack passed away a few years ago, but character like no other teacher. I mean, as far as character, nobody could match Jack for just being a character. Maybe with the exception of uh, a guy named Bill Sanchez who taught at the uh, Academy. Bill's a wonderful character too. Anyway, uh, Jack used to say, ah, these guys, all they want to do is come up with gimmicks. They just want gimmicks, you know? He says, no one wants to learn how to paint anymore. They just want to come up with a gimmick. These drips these guys are using nowadays, that's a gimmick. That was Jack. And, uh, Jack was not afraid to offer his opinion on things. Uh, John wants to know if it's possible the old guys didn't have such, <laughs> such press deadlines for their illustrations. Yeah, that's true. Really? Yep, that's absolutely true. Uh, Norman, I mean, I'm sure they had the ability, but no, they had more time. It was just more lead. You know, the world was different. What can I say? <laughs> things... It, things weren't in as much of a hurry. So, yeah, you're right. They didn't have that. And it's gotten worse, everybody. Do you... uh, it, here's why. Illustrators now, these poor guys now. I Something, this thing called the Internet. Even even at, towards the end of my career as, as an illustrator, which I assume is over. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't done any illustration work for years. But... One of the things, I gotta keep my eye on the time. Oh, okay. That, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna get this big mass in here so I can start to figure things out. One of, the, uh, one of the things is the internet has been wonderful and it's also been an enemy because now they can look over your shoulder almost while you're painting. So a little raw sienna, I probably have some dirt in this brush, which is fine. I don't want it, I never want any color to be all that clean right in the beginning. Uh, so we're just going to kind of rub some of this stuff in. I'm going to mix a little white, maybe a little, some other colors into it. So I get some of the areas, a little bit of blue because it goes cool. Uh, but that internet, now they can say, well, show me where you are on your piece right now. Well, I knew illustrators that would say, oh, I'm coming along fine. They hadn't even started it. I knew guys that were, that would do that. I, I actually wasn't one of those, but I did know other artists that were like that. Okay. So. Nowadays, you can't do that because they want to see where you, what, where it's at right now. And I did a, I don't know how many years ago, it wasn't that long ago, maybe six years ago, I did some paintings that were going to be used as illustrations for um, Samuel Adams' beer. And they want to see these things at all stages. And they were paintings. These were... These were big oil paint, loose. They wanted them very, very loose, looser than I generally work, um, which was fun. And they were painting well for them, so I can't, couldn't complain. But uh, my God, I realized what that internet has done. It has really caused havoc for illustrators. The other thing is because so much work now is being done digital, they think you can do that in the blink of an eye. You can't, it takes just as long. To, to do good work. You can do bad work. 
Hell, I could do bad work back then. Quick. So the internet is actually, it's good in many respects because it has solved some problems. I did some work years ago for Franklin Mint. Uh, cars of the 50s, Chevys of the 50s, right? So Franklin Mint sends me these little miniature cars to paint. And I would take them out in the backyard, take my camera, set them up, get the light where I really liked it on them so they looked like a real car, came in real close, photographed it, painted it. It was one of the Chevys that I did. Most of the time it came out, yeah, no problem. Just actually, they were very happy. One of them I did, I sent it in. I got a notice back and they said, you know, our engineer who came, who did the design on, to, you know, to authenticate it. These were super authentic, by the way. They were just, they were like little miniature real cars. Well, he's, he messed up and he did a, um, let me get some shadows in here. He did a, um, he, or excuse me, he made a mistake. And the mistake was that he put the door handles too high. They're lower, actually. Can you go back? And these were in acrylic paintings, and they were really tight, super realistic stuff. Tighter than I normally do, but like I said, they were paying well, and they were kind of fun. And they were a challenge. So I said, he said, or, he said, we might be able to do that with a computer. Just raise the door handle. And I immediately said, do it with the computer. I didn't want the piece back for me to, I mean, it would have been a real problem. I would have had to mix up that exact green of the car, uh, paint that out, paint it back in. If it were a loose painting, it would have been a lot easier, but it was a very tight, refined painting. So in that regard, the computer saved me. And I'm thankful for that when it does that kind of stuff. So. Um, it's it's just a different world and there's not there's not as much illustration as there once was that's the other thing can you name some of the female illustrators from that era <laughs> female, female illustrators not from the golden age i can't the I, Red Rose Girls I can um there was lorraine fox who was who was quite popular uh diane um oh wait is it come on jesse wilcox Oh, Jesse Wilcox Smith. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. I need help, you guys. Any, any people like that? It's a children's book. Um, Diane, Leo and Diane Dillon, that was it, um, were great illustrators. And I think he's still illustrating. I don't know if she's still around. Um, but there were some, just some dynamite people. Even when I was illustrating, I, it, when I go back real far, it's harder. Betty Levine was doing some wonderful work. Uh, when I was illustrating, um, you know, there's there's been there's been a lot. Ray mentioned Sarah Sarah Stillwell Weber, Joyce Valentine. There you go. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Um, Norm said, "Good, fast, or cheap, pick two. I remember you always talking about that when you were illustrating. Okay, I said that. Yeah, <laughs> I did say that. Let me let me go in. A, a, a friend of mine named Roger Beerworth, who is a really very talented uh, illustrator gave a talk at Society of Illustrators one time in Los Angeles. And he used this line that I remember to this day, and I never thought of it until he, he came up with it. He said, Cl clients have to know there's three things to, a, to creating an illustration. There's really good, which most people want. There's really fast and there's really cheap. Pick two. You can't get all three. So if she wants something just phenomenal and you want it really fast, first of all, that may be impossible. But I'll tell you, you might have to hire someone to help you. So it's not going to be cheap. I'm going to be putting in day and night. So I'm charging you for that. So that's, that's the, you can have it fast and cheap. Sure, but it may not be as good as some of the stuff that you've seen of mine because it's fast and it's less expensive, right? And then the third one was fast. Yeah, you can have it good and you might might even be able to get it at a decent price, but you gotta give me time. 
and I'll fit it into my schedule and do a, just a bang up job for you. So those are the three characteristics of uh, dealing in the commercial illustration field. And I'm sure people are still dealing with it today, but I'll bet you anything, the deadlines have gotten worse. And then you have art directors waiting in your studio till three in the morning. Yeah, you want to tell her that? Tell them that one. Mm -hmm. Let I'll let Anna tell this little story. Yeah, I was working on a film called Moscow Poster, Moscow and the Hudson for Paul Mazursky, great director. Um, working with an art director, Kevin Nolan, at Columbia Pictures. We, I had worked on this movie and done sketches and idea sketches and comps and everything you can imagine for probably close to a year, along with other projects, but that one project went on for a year. All of a sudden they decided they wanted, and Columbia at this time was notorious for not using, for only using photography. And so Kevin called me up and he says, hey, they want to use illustration and they want this kind of Steinberg look. Um, so but we need it. Paul wants it on his desk tomorrow at nine. For a meeting. For a meeting. With type. Finish. Finish paint. Finish piece. Uh, and I don't even know what time it was. It was just... so I got to work at three in the morning. Kevin came over to my house, and I had the piece pretty well done. So he called a printer, and. We sat there drinking margaritas at three in the morning, made a big picture of it, waiting for the printer to get there. The piece was printed and delivered to Paul Mazursky in his office by 9.30 the next morning. So the printer took it and he they worked all night. Um, so when Anna said, people in your house at all hours of the day, and that happens. Thankfully, the art director is just a wonderful guy who I had a very good rapport with and uh, everything went quite smooth. So I was really happy with that. And I was just happy that, you know, at some point when you guys were illustrating, sometimes you're just happy that they're happy. You well, know, it's, you, so. yeah, it's not a, a line that I used to use when I was teaching at Art Center. Uh, for young illustrators, guys that are going into the field, is learn how to enjoy the process because you may not always enjoy the result. Meaning, you know it could be better. You always know it could be better. And so you better enjoy the process of creating art, which I believe true much the same in painting. So we're gonna get a little bit more of this laid in here so we get everything covered. And I'll go back and work on the trees. And in about the last uh, 15 minutes, I'm gonna deal with the water. What's the light blue on the palette? The light blue, I have two light blues actually. I laid out, I actually laid out a, um, something called, it's by uh, Gam, Gamblin. Uh, I, I laid out a radiant turquoise and then when I finally decided that this is what I was going to paint, I said, I don't think I'm going to need that turquoise. I think I'm going to need more just a radiant blue, which is a grayer version. So that's what it is. Carving in some of that the cool shadow back in there. My God, it's starting to come together. This whole area is just a mess right now. So we'll have to fix that. I can see right now, I can see I need to go back in and start to, put in some more of the rock back in here. Pick the light on this, it's kind of a light, light blue gray. So anyway, the reason I laid that, that color out is I figured it's already got white mixed in it. So I'm halfway to where I need to be. And um, I can just augment that with a little brown and other little colors ultramarine if I need it and so but I, I without use it going to white right immediately it's it's just a time saver truthfully you can you could get by with four colors it was basically white yellow blue and and red you could probably get by with just those colors you know look what Anders Zorn did with a limited palette so granted you can do that it's just it's a time saver that's literally what it is it's a way for me to kind of 
cut down on having to mix. Working on limited palette stuff, by the way, is really fun. So I'm, Anna and I were going over, I was playing around, I did a little study of New York skyline, and I'm thinking about doing that next week, kind of a, a rooftop of a lot of the, the, what do you call it, towers and the um, water, tower. water towers, and things of that nature. I haven't decided. At the other, my other decision is kind of a, and I don't know if it's good, I found an old, old print, a little three by five print of our daughter, uh, a pose she took for me. I never did a painting from it, always liked it. Uh, it doesn't have the greatest lighting, but so I'm toying between those two for next week. I don't know. See how I, see how I feel. I just, like I said, I just decided on this, honestly, probably 10 to 15 minutes before it started. And that's when I kind of scribbled out that, that this line work. Okay, let's finish up a little bit of this so I can keep moving. I've got a. sometimes I find myself getting lost in one area and then all of a sudden realizing, oh my God, I wasted too much time there. And I, I guarantee you, probably most of you have done that. So um, Nora has some questions, a few cleanup questions. How do you deal with disposing of old chirps, large? Also, how do you clean rags? How about your palette? Just chirp and a painter's razor blade gizmo? Um, I don't use chirp to clean my palette. Best brush cleaner. <clears throat> Bev told me about Meyer soap, which has been best so far. It's good. It's good. I, I use Murphy's oil is, is pretty much what I use. I kind of clean my brushes with chirp pretty much. Then I uh, go over to the sink and use pretty much Murphy's oil soap. Uh, to, to finish the cleaning. Then when I'm all done, this is the, this is the big key, you guys. If you don't get anything out of today's session, write this down. Use hair conditioner on your brush when you're all done. When you're done cleaning and you're done soaping, you're done whatever, use hair conditioner. To, to it's real hair. I And get the cheap stuff. You don't, reform them. Yeah. You, what you do is you basically go through your you take your brush you clean it up whatever you need to do you scrub it with a hair conditioner like you would hair and then you form the shape of the brush the way you the way the brush hopefully always was and then you leave it alone you shape it lay it down let it dry overnight and the next day you got almost a brand new brush and i don't remember who told me this and i learned this about at least 10 years, if not 15 years ago. And honest to God, it works. I've been doing it ever since. It's the last thing I do at night is I clean my brushes. Oh, sorry. Hi, Nora, by the way. Uh, now, disposing. That was the other question, right? Um, our recycle center here. Yeah, we have a recycle center. Uh, I, stuff. I don't worry too much about my turp. I let it it evaporates. In other words, this was full. My can, my turp can right here was full when I started. It's down to about, I've used about a third of it in my painting. And it'll evaporate. It'll evaporate just the way it does. So the sludge, about once a month, I clean out the sludge. Now what do I do with that? I wrap it in a rag, put it in a plastic bag, and either we take it to a recycle center or I put it in the garbage, which I probably shouldn't be doing. But that's basically it. Uh, and John wanted just to make sure that you wash the conditioner out of the brush before painting the next day. Did no, you? no, nope, nope. All these brushes, that brush had conditioner in it. It's got a nice shape to it. So you just it's never been washed out, but watch. You just do that, yeah, before you get started. Yeah, you don't have to wash the conditioner out. That's a great question. I, I wish I knew who told me this, this, the whole thing because it's, it's been a godsend. It's really been wonderful. Your yeah. So we're starting. To, I'm starting to get kind of the feeling of the rocks. I'm going to put the greens in now. Uh, I don't have this in quite the way I want it here. So let's kind of scrub something in so we get a little bit of that rock form. I said I wasn't going to put it in, but I did. So I lied. Um, I need to put more greenery in. So go back to my green, go back to my ochre, and white. 
green, ochre, and white. And if I need to liven up the green, I will throw some yellow and white into it. I think this is probably a good starting point right here. Uh, just to kind of, and I'm just going to have to be real indicative with this. Back in here, I'm going to have to darken the trees. There's some real strong lights. It's going to help a lot. Uh, I want to get, I don't want this area to look too flat. Like I haven't, so I'm going to put a combination of darks. So I can see some darks. And for darks, I'm using green, brown, and this kind of a mud color I have over here that is, I've allowed to kind of develop. Push, use the other side of the brush. Uh, I, I, talk, I was talking about this in a class yesterday that I was teaching. Um, another thing to think about is the facet of the brush that you're using, meaning are you using, if you notice, I'm not, pre I'm not using, I'm only using that part of the tip, but sometimes I use the side because I get a more interesting mark, a more descriptive mark with that. Sometimes I use strictly the tip, but in doing trees and things of this nature, you want, you do not want those edges to be real crisp and hard. You want kind of a diffused edge to, to capture the characteristic of the foliage that you're trying to depict. That's, see that works a little bit better. In here I could use a few more darks. I can see more darks there. I already got that dark in. Let's see if we got some darks. I'm gonna darken these a little bit now. Still keep the blue in it. Top of the tree. We have foliage coming over this tree. So I want there. Now we have a couple little darks back here. A branch coming off here. Things that I didn't see in the beginning that I'm seeing now. And that's pretty normal. Every time I go, I, I usually refer to this as revisiting an area. As I revisit an area, very often I will all of a sudden realize things that I didn't see before because I was looking for something else. And at different stages of your painting, you're going to be looking for different things. So we're going to get that in there. A little bit of the, kind of that warm rocky area. I'm going to mix it right into that paint because it's a little too warm. There's a little bit of a pull as it comes back here. And then it comes down. And there's a rock right there too. Really cool. Oh, I hit it already. Son of a gun. No, there's another rock. Okay. I almost, I think I'm going to start switching down to a smaller brush. Uh, Carmen Luna Harneal said she is a recent graduate from, I'm assuming, the Academy. Who? Carmen Luna Harneal. Huh. A graduate Good. here in CU, and um, she graduated last year. In what major? I um, don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming fine art. But... Huh? Maybe not. Uh, Sharpening up edges. Let's go back. I'm going to switch down, guys. I'm going to switch to a, I have a big filbert here and I have a flat. That flat's smaller than I want. I want a bigger flat. I don't want to go too, oh, what do I got here? I don't want to go too, um, too small too quick. Okay. Well, I'm just going to use a big filbert, hell of it. Okay, we're going to start to pick up some of the lights back in there. If you remember a couple weeks ago I did a um, seascape or not seascape but there's a lot of little pieces of light on rocks back in here now the great thing about this filbert is it's a very it's a long excuse me egbert an egbert is the name of the of the brush and an egbert generally is a long filbert a long bristled filbert so i'm hitting negatives back in here and i'm mixing that radiant blue with a little bit of brown and a little bit of, of Naples just to kind of give, and I'm looking for what I, I call this activity. My terminal, I don't know if anyone else refers to it, but I call it activity. And there was a lot of active areas back in there, small little areas around that. And the, now I've defined that bush, but there are also a few little lights and I'm going to take light. Now, if my paint is not sticking at this point, I'm either going to use 
uh, solvent-free gel or the, um, what do you call it, medium? Uh, la, la, la. Safflower oil. I don't know why I'm <laughs> trying to think of too many things at the same time. So, um, <clears throat> Part of a trunk. So that, you're keeping it wet. So you can very wet. Very wet. It. A little finger painting there. Uh, and kind of gray up in here, kind of like not real obvious of a color. So I'm just kind of mixing it with a lot of the dirt that I have there, a dirty color. And we get a little bit of activity, break up, and what it is is light hitting on rocks. A little bit up in here. And so we're just, we're indicating the light. We're not really even indicating the rock. We're just indicating the feeling of the light as it hits the rock. And smaller strokes will create the illusion of smaller rocks. So if I, if I don't use very large, chunky strokes, and that's why this brush, if I push down, I get a big area. If I just delicately touch with the tip, I get a small area. And that's one of the advantages of it. So we're going to paint the top of this rock in and it overlaps that rock. Okay. I don't want to overpick it. So the rocks are starting to, at least to me, make sense. Hopefully to you. You notice I use the word starting to. So light here, top of that rock, side of the rock. Little Rock sticks his head up right there at the bottom. That's a nice stroke. And I like that stroke. Every now and then you do them, you, you, you hit these strokes and you feel like, man, that's what, I was, that's what I was working for all along. And they don't come along often enough. But what the, went a little too strong there color-wise, could be a little darker. A little darker. I've got a dark mixed up down right here on my palette, so I just kind of keep dipping that color into that. So that's the side of that rock. And then there's some water that creeps out behind, so I'm almost getting ready for the water. In fact, I think I'll probably get into that because I want to hit a few more yellow greens. Okay, I'm, what have I got about? Uh, let's see, I'm missing a few. Um, Faith wants to know what your favorite medium is. My kind of talked about that. What is she talking about? Uh, acrylics, oils, is she talking about that or is she talking about medium paint to Probably paint with? To paint with I'm oh, safflower oil. So we do a few of these little strokes, a little busy to give some, some of the character. And I, they're also a little lighter because that's how I see them. It's not that I'm uh, inventing interesting colors. That's how I see the color. And I'm just adding a little green now and then, kind of that's too strong. I'm going to add more green. Yeah, that's better. And I'm just, I'm almost nervously letting the brush go down. I'm not trying to be overly deliberate. So oil is your favorite, basically. Oil is my favorite painting medium. And what kind of easel is that? I can't remember the brand. Easel? Yeah. God, it's a Richeson. It's, I, I need to get a new easel. So a little nothing little wrong with, little nothing little wrong little with that brand. It's, it's old. And as you can see, I've been painting on it for several years and I should treat myself and get a new easel. Um, I'm one of these people that I'm not an equipment nut. There are, there are artists I know that have to have the latest trend and everything. And I knew this artist, actually, uh, there's a product designer. And he taught at the Academy of Art, and he taught at Art Center. Um, it was a character, another another great, I don't know what it is about some artists being just great characters, a guy named Gaylord Eccles. Uh, he said, he always thought, great artist doesn't have to have a great studio or a great, it could create great art in a barn. And I always kind of listened to that, and being frugal, have kind of a, adhered to that policy. Not that my studio is a barn, but, um, and not that I wouldn't love to have a bigger, more beautiful, I see people online all the time showing their studios thinking, whoa, that's impressive. 
but mine works fine. I get what I want done. Um, I w am ready for a new easel eventually. So. Someone asked earlier about how you can paint and talk at the same time, but I think it's just you're, you're <laughs> I'm shooting. ambidextrous at that. No, that's wrong. I'm Besides sorry. Besides teaching and explaining yeah. what you're doing all the time, which you do every day, you've, you've always done that and you could work with chaos all around you and still accomplish. And I have. <laughs> still accomplish what you're doing. Uh, that's, she gave the perfect answer. That's exactly, I've done this. I, I started teaching um, I like to think of when I was 12, but I didn't. I started teaching in 1974 at Art Center professionally, uh, where they asked me to come in and teach. And so I felt flattered. And here's this, here's this school that I had gone to, and they're asking me back to teach. And so I went and taught. And um, over the years, I found the thing that helped the most is if I just didn't paint in front of people, but I explained what the hell I was trying to do and accomplish. And that kind of has carried over for several years. And so that's, I'm used to it. I guess that's a simple answer. I'm used to it. Uh, I also found it helped more, it helped the students more, which is, as a teacher, is always your goal. It's kind of trying to help the students. And so we get the other, these dark rocks in here, by the way. I could switch over my bigger brush, but. So we're going to start in on this water, so we can get the water going. Then I can, if if I when I have time for, I'll go back and do more leaves. But let's get the water going. So I'm going to clean the brush, pick up white. I'm going to paint the water in two or three different stages. First stage, white and ultramarine. Yeah, and I could probably use a little medium and dull the ultramarine down with just a little bit of brown, so it's not too pronounced. And what we'll do is we'll paint kind of some of the splashes as they appear to. So we use the side of that brush. Just barely let the brush. So we're just kind of raking, just kind of scuffing color down there and to create that splash. If I have to and the paint's too stiff, I just add more medium. That's going to go over this way. It's going to come down in here. So, Cindy, so do you have a table so you can put your palette in front of you? Yes, I do. You're the first person that's asked that question. In all these weeks, I've never even brought it up. Something I learned about myself, and I try and encourage students. Most people, when they're first learning to paint, myself included, paint like this. Hold their brush close, and they get their eye down on it. By putting a palette in front of you, this is a 24 by 24 palette. I have a larger palette I use too, but this one's 24 24. Um, by putting the palette in front of you, it keeps you away from your painting. And in doing so, you see your painting more as a viewer might see your painting, not as um, a practitioner, someone who's just sitting down and trying to uh, make everything perfect. So you can see this is kind of a, a blue, white, gray color. And that's kind of where the splashes occurred. Oh, I got this beautiful little plateau of right here. Okay, it's right there. And it works its way up here. That's where the splat, it's all kind of come. So it goes down, over, down, comes down here, works its way right up here. That's ugly. Let's see what we can do. Good. Carolyn said she moved her palette in front of her easel after watching your first pandemic demo. Good. Makes a difference. It does. It, can it keeps you away from sitting right down on top of your painting. And when I paint plain air outside, if you think about it, your palette is here and your piece, so you're automatically, you're used to your palette being in front of you. Um, it's there's so much logic to it. I can't express it. So. Uh, it's it's wonderful. It's I've done it for years. I, I can't even remember when I didn't do it. When I was illustrating, I know I didn't do it because I worked in acrylics and I had my palette off to my right. And but boy, I think if I had done it, the other thing is that I haven't done because of the quickness of this painting is step back and stepping back does the same thing. It allows you to see your painting. 
at a distance and not right on top of it. So, man, if you guys can step back. When I'm painting outside, I am back probably at least every five minutes, at least. Now, you notice I haven't stood back. Why is that? Simply, it's a demo. And when I do demos, I should stand back more, but I don't uh, because I'll knock over things behind me right now. So we're getting the, the, can you see the movement of the water starting to happen um, down in here? I'm trying to keep, keep true to the time. I think we got about 10 minutes. I try not to go over an hour and a half. Started these things with the concept of doing hour paintings. Um, I could easily, easily go another 40 minutes on this and carry it further. But a couple things happen. We lose viewership because <laughs> it gets a little, it's like the reason I don't paint really tight for demos is it's kind of like watching grass grow. It's like, it really is, it's slow because painting really tight and realistic is a very slow process. It does not happen quickly. So for the sake of demos, it's always better if you paint a little looser. Also, I like loose paintings. So, I'm not gonna lie. You know, try and try and think of of myself as a some great artist like Nikolai Fetchin sitting here and just putting these gobs of paint down. I'm not putting anywhere near the thick kind of paint that he would put down. But we got got to get some of this under gray color before I put the water on top of it. So there's some some kind of grayish brown characteristics in here. Knowing that I'm gonna come over it with water, there's some beautiful little abstract gray brown kind of in here. And we just kind of rub that brush around because we're trying to indicate it. It's almost like we're on location and the water is moving. It's very hard to paint really refined in other words, if you paint the water too stiff, it doesn't feel like it's moving. It feels like you're trying to overpick the little spots. I've seen people try and pick all the little white spots. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, at least not for me. I've never been able to pull it off. So let's get the water, the blue gray is kind of taking this brush, using the brush, letting the brush do the work. Tom was saying that he enjoys seeing how you hold the brush and it was one of the things that you wrote him about <clears throat> about uh, moving up near the end of the brush <clears throat> yeah it's so much of what you do becomes um, trial and error you learn and you kind of you tuck that away up here and hopefully you retain it I retain some of it and some of it I forget about and then as I'm painting I go oh you know I know better than that that's, the, that's probably the most common line I use when I talk to myself while I'm painting. Why did you do that? You know better than that. Scolding myself. Hey, John Poon, he wants to know um, uh -oh. what your thoughts are on sitting as you paint. Are you able to get as good a result? Sometimes I sit towards the end of a painting. Um, I, I try and not sit ever at the beginning. Um, a lot of that has to do with me getting standing back from a piece. Uh, you should be able to paint both ways. Uh, and I do. I paint both ways. I paint where I'm right on top of a painting. I mean, where I'm sitting down and I also paint fr from uh, a standing, standing position. Up. But generally, I think most of the time I'm standing. Outdoors, I never sit. I actually did one time because my back was bugging me and uh, I did a at a beach, and I thought, oh, here we go, I got back problems. It went away, I never had them again, but that was the only time, so I don't like sitting. Um, I've seen these great paintings of Edgar Payne and John Sargent painting on location, sometimes standing, sometimes sitting. Um, not that I wanna copy them, <laughs> but at the same time, there's probably something to it. But as far as, it, it, it's really personal. Richard Schmidt sits almost all the time. And I, I think he said it's because his back, if I recall right. 
I think he said it was really had a lot to do with the fact that his back um, bothered him. So a lot of it has to do with you. Be comfortable. Two things. If, if, be comfortable and have fun. Most people get into painting because it's fun, because they like it. It's fun. It's kind of a, and it's very easy to get to the point where you let that fun go away because it, you, the difficulty starts to uh, emerge. And as that difficulty emerges, people lose sight of the fact that it's supposed to be fun. So let's go more to a white now. I'm going to add a little bit of uh, Naples yellow to the white to keep the sunlight on the water. And I need to add a lot of medium because I'm laying paint on top of paint right now. Paint on paint. Okay, so we're going to move it there. Bring it here. Um, Jenny wants to know, is it important to have a focal point in your paintings? Or do you figure this out before? before you begin or does it well focal points of water in this case is the, is the splash and the movement of the water um, is it important that's a that's a question that could be debated forever I think the focal point emerges as you're painting um, you can you can start with a concept of a focal point um, and I know it's a word that's tossed around a hell of a lot uh, I don't always say I have it right from the outset, even though there is one, sometimes it's subliminal. Um, you just have to kind of decide who you are, the kind of painting you want to do. I mean, my focal point was, is why are you painting this painting? Think of, if you think about that, why are you painting the painting? That's your focal point. Are you painting that painting for, because you love painting trees? And you want the you want to get, play with light and character in trees. Are you painting it because the way the light strikes the ground? Are you painting it because of the water? Are you, you know all of those things come into play to answer the question as to whether it's important? I leave that up to the artist. I I am. Um, I think a focal point happens. You can start with an intent, and that intent can change somewhat too. This is, the, this is the fun stuff, you guys. Sometimes if your paint's dry, you can really go over and pull a dry brush over this, but there's something about a spontaneity of, of a la prima painting, the wet into wet, that is just hard to pass up. So Ray said that he, he'll never forget when we walked over to him when he was holding the brush too close to the tip and um, said, <laughs> Try holding the brush near the end of the handle. You paid for it, so you might as well use it. Use all of it. So I really said that? I guess so. You paid for it? That's good. Yeah. Crap. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know I actually come up with little <laughs> lines that actually make sense. <laughs> and Suzanne was saying that um, sitting kind of restricts. I got to stand back, you guys, just for a second. Yeah, so you're not gonna no. drop it. Okay, it's working. It's not working great, but it's working. Anyway, Suzanne said that you, um, sitting kind of restricts the freedom to back up and take a look at the work. Yep, that's exactly right. It definitely restricts you. So I'm painting into very wet paint, which is actually beneficial because I can make really kind of interesting types of strokes. So you guys, you see how it's a focal point now? Say, I hope you guys are saying yes out loud because I can't hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, Jennifer said, Jennifer Foster, how are you? We miss you. Um, I know that you paint different sizes, but is there a size that feels more natural? Or when you first started, did you have difficulty working on different scales? I'm not sure about the second part of that question. The first part, the first part is most of these these demo things that I've done have been uh, 18 by 24. Truthfully, I like painting big, but I do it as much. I don't want to sound totally altruistic here. I do it for you guys. Um, I just think it's easier to look 
at larger i mean in terms of a demonstration literally i started doing it because of teaching at school if i have a class of fifteen to thirty people let's say not thirty but let's say there's fifteen people ok in a class and i paint nine by twelve the problem is the guys in the back just barely can see so what i started doing is and this came from teaching is started working larger uh, for demonstration purposes as far as what do I like as far as doing my own painting um, I do like larger I must admit I didn't always uh, when I first started painting this was my favorite size 18 by 24 and then it moved to 24 by 36 and now 30 by 40 doesn't even feel that large so you know it's it really comes down to there's no right or wrong to this first of all you guys there's absolutely no right or wrong it's how you feel about it comes down to that okay we're going to get some little some foreground water and then maybe a few leaves and kind of call it so we'll put a little light in there oh, i need to get a little bit more color in here how did you make the transition from acrylics to oils I always worked in oil. I, I worked in oil, uh, never a lot, but I, I never, whenever I'd given the chance to do uh, a painting for myself, I did it in oil because I wanted to learn it. I wanted to get better at it. I mean, I, I could paint in oil fair when I got out of school, fair, but all I could paint is like a head. Uh, I don't know if I did any good figures. I really don't. Um, that came in time. They, they got better. They got better. Um, they still keep getting better. Hopefully they're going to keep getting better. Um, of course, every now and then you do something and it turns out like the junk and you think you're reverting back to uh, bad school paintings. Um, so it depends on what you want to try, you guys. It's get good at something and then move on. Don't, don't, don't create a rut. A little bit of reflection there. That's what that is. Uh, I want to get some of this white water as it really splashes down. So I'm going to get really thick, a lot of medium, mixing it right into that kind of whitish yellow color I have, but it's thicker. And here's what we're going to do. All right. Look how thick. The, can you see that nice thick stroke? Yeah. That's the most interesting stroke in the whole damn painting right now. Um, one of the things I want to do is I want to take some of this and bring it over that rock. <laughs> So you just did that with a dry brush? I just did it with a dry brush. I didn't need to put paint down. Okay. You don't always have to put paint down. Sometimes you have a color down there. Use it. It works. Move it around. Give an edge to that rock. I kind of screwed it up, and that's why I went back. Uh, I'm mixing a little bit of blue back into that, a little bit of that radiant blue, and we'll kind of come in with the way the water is kind of scraping over the rocks here. Jenny was saying now the water is brown. Is that because of what's on the land beside it, or is it the color of what's showing from beneath? It's the color of what's showing beneath. It's what it is. Take a rock, any rock. <laughs> Sound like a magician. <laughs> Take a rock, any rock. Um, <laughs> put it underwater. Look at it. It gets more colorful, mm -hmm. and that's what's happening here. The water is very shallow. It's just kind of rushing over the rocks, and you have to kind of understand that a little bit. Um, Running water, honest to God, I love painting this stuff. I had two others running water things picked out that I was thinking of doing today. And I let Anna, Anna actually picked this one. She said, I like that one the best. The I, I, showed her, <laughs> I showed her about four images. And I said, this one's, this one's the most difficult. This one's, and this was the second easiest I felt. There was one I thought that I had picked that was easier. And this was second. And so about 10 minutes before we went on, I said, okay, this is what I'm doing. i got to get some marks down on this thing so I know what I, where I'm putting things. And um, it's fun. I'll have to evaluate. You know, all of these paintings that I've done like this, I evaluate them a day or two later. Um, sometimes I like them. Sometimes I like them less. But they're all... My goal is for them to be informative for you guys. Um, my second goal is for them to look decent.
So it's a combination of those two things that I'm, I'm really concerned about. Number one, that you actually, it helps you. Secondly, that I don't embarrass myself. Little light there, a little more light on the edge of these rock. I can begin to pronounce things a little bit more. Pronouncing meaning adding a little bit more firmness, value, contrast. So I wanted that rock to sit on top in front of all these other areas. I want it to feel like there's detail in the rock without there being detail. And as we move back, same thing. Like I can see right now, a lot of these rocks can be pronounced more. So I can take some of this white and blue, pick it up a little bit, and I can come over with as much or as little of tree foliage. I'm going to grab this brush right here and we'll put a few little tree marks in here because I'm out of time really. Right. <clears throat> so yeah, but that's not my, my goal isn't to sit, sit here and do a perfect finished paint. Actually it is. Uh, uh, Cause it would take me too long. Well, hopefully everybody's having lunch. Just everybody's having lunch. Maybe. So Boots said, um, get good at something, then move on. Great advice. Now I just have to get good at something. That's don't we all. <laughs> hey, you're a fabulous painter Boots. A lot of these guys are. In fact, I don't know if John Poon is still on, but John was a just was. <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, I didn't mean what. John used to paint in oils, is what I meant, and was absolutely a fabulous, fabulous landscape oil painter. And then John moved on to acrylics for his own reasons. Uh, I won't go into those, but in doing so, John paints in acrylics and they're as good as any oil painter I've ever seen. And I can say the same with a, a fellow uh, acquaintance of ours, and that's a guy named Gil Dillinger, who is just, who knocks it out of the park with acrylic paintings. Uh, in fact, you look at him and you go, no way, that's not acrylics. So there's, you find what works for you guys. If you guys wanna work in watercolor, I know I thought about one of these days I had to do a watercolor demo, and then I thought, eh, I don't paint it that much, I might really screw it up. Um, so Jamie said after finishing school, she's noticed a um, tendency to get confused with color in relation to value. She's been drawing much more to try to refresh value usage. Do you have any advice? Color versus value. Is that what you're asking? Um, well, value is the most important without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's not even a close second. Color is something you can try if you... If you're having problems, work from black and white. To, even if you go on location, shoot it, and you're going to paint on location, shoot it in black and white, and take a look at that. Um, a black and white gives you your value. Uh, color is something that, I, what, what I've honestly, and I, I've said this a lot to people, everybody can learn to draw pretty good if you work at it. And everybody can learn to render pretty good if you work at it. Color is something you work on forever, truthfully. You just, it's one of those things that just when you start to get, your taste may change and you may want to get into other colors. The reason that you're experiencing that is you've grown. You've become better. And because you've become better, uh, what happens is you're demanding more from yourself. And you're starting to see things you didn't see. When you were struggling, at first you might have been struggling with form. You might have been struggling with um, getting trees to look like trees, getting rocks to look like rocks, getting water or oceans to look like oceans. But as you move on, you start to realize that, yeah, I'm starting to get that, but I don't like my color. So don't let that mess you up. I mean, that's just something, work from black and whites. Start working with a limited palette. That's another good suggestion. The limited palette will help. Four color palette, black, white, yellow ochre, burnt sienna or terra rosa or Venetian red, one of those colors. But do that and I think you'll find um, it'll change. 
limited palette paintings are great exercises. They are they're fantastic exercises. It's and when we usually start teaching painting at the academy, all of our teachers, we all get people going in limited palettes before they ever get into anything complicated. So it looks like your phone may run out of battery and I can't I'm about done anyway. I mean, there's a lot of little picky stuff I could put. I haven't put any. Um, Since the microphone is plugged into the phone, I, can't. I haven't put any branches in. I know I did this a few weeks ago. Let's see if it works now. This is just a rubber brush. Oh, look it! I can put a twig in, just by removing paint. I was trying to find the. Um... Moscow on the Hudson piece and post it since we were talking about that earlier because every time I see that movie poster it reminds me of it's not a great margaritas. yeah it's not a great piece it's it's <clears throat> okay but it's um it's a memorable piece because of what all we went through what transpired that's way too heavy-handed you guys so I just chop that down make it thinner lose it a little bit more it's because this brush is just a little bit too big but this is where your branches show in between. There's another branch coming over here. And this tree back in here could be a little brighter right there. A little bit of light there. Back on these rocks. That's probably pretty good. That's as good as I'm, I'm going to get for the involvement and chaos of this. Um, hopefully we made some sense out of chaos. And that was one of the goals today was to try and take the concept of a lot of uh, chaos and along with the running water and begin to, these are liners, these are little, you know, this is where you do your little touch up drawing stuff like adding a shadow. Anyway, I'm not gonna, Continue. I think what I'm going to do is, I haven't stood back at this, so I really, uh, I stepped back at one point to see how it was looking, but I think I'm ready for lunch, and uh, I'll come back and look at it if I want to do any touch-ups. A, a comment's been made, a uh, question about plain air work. I very seldom go back on plain air work. I may, if I do, I go, I, I put maybe 10 to 15 minutes in it. I don't even know if I've ever spent 20 on these kind of paintings, these demonstration paintings, I never try and go in and make it look like a refined 20 hour painting. What I might do is go back and put 20 minutes into it and do some things that all of a sudden I notice. So I will post this, I'll try and post it at this stage and then if I do touch ups on it, I'll try and post it at the other stage, okay? I hope it was informative. I had fun. Um, I inform myself and I absolutely appreciate the questions, you guys, uh, along with you tuning in. Uh, Michael Godfrey, great questions about illustration. Ray, interesting comments. John, thank you. I don't even know if uh, Chuck is with us. I haven't heard any more puns, so I kind of don't think so. The rest of you guys, all of you, please stay well. Um, we're not going out too much, so stay well. And paint. Yeah. And we'll see you next week and I'll try and do something a little different. Okay? Thank you and bye. Okay, thanks for hanging out, everyone. And yes, it's every Friday at noon, so hopefully see you next Friday. Yeah. And we'll see what Craig decides to do at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> I think he enjoys waiting until the last minute. I don't, enjoy, I don't enjoy <laughs> I just can't decide. Um, so maybe the New York scene. Yeah. We'll see. Should we show him what? Yeah. If you want. Here. No, it'll be a different Yeah. Um, maybe next week we can show up and see what's up. There you go. And I think your phone's going to die. So. so good to see all of you. Thank you, thank you for hanging out. Okay, ciao, ciao.